Luck cannot be in there. Everyone's like, oh, Craig, you're lucky. You got this, Craig, you're lucky. Everything you do is luck. Bullshit. Because before it was luck, it was a belief. And every day with no one watching at five in the morning by myself, I trained it because I believed in it. Then I mastered it. No, I remastered it and remastered it in hopes that one day my trained ability collided with an opportunity to show it off. That's what luck is. Start to finish a blueprint that every single module inside of it you create, you own. Nothing subjective in there. It's all you. It's a guy that's willing to get knocked down, finally tell someone fortune, stand back up, stand back up. The perseverance to see it through, the never say die attitude. Now the fun begins. What is up YouTube, live via satellite here, and today we are talking Kingdom Manga Chapter 547. And my god, Gyo in this chapter is talking so reckless. I mean, even going as far as to call Shin's inheritance straight luck. I mean, when I think about luck, a lot of different things come to mind, like Heki's lucky to be alive in the series, Heki's pretty lucky to be a general, even the possibility that Heki may one day be lucky enough to be with Yotanwa. But one thing that does not come to mind is Shin inheriting Oki's glaive. That has never crossed my mind as something that was lucky. But while we are on the topic of Oki's glaive, the goat himself actually made an appearance in this chapter and it automatically makes this chapter a 10 out of 10 for me. Now one thing many people don't know is my favorite character in all of Kingdom was Oki. I love this guy man, everything about Oki was cool. Even when you look this guy's stats up in the Kingdom guidebooks, his charisma is at 100, as it should be, cause Oki is the man. And I ain't gonna lie man, it hurt me when Oki died, it hurt. Like, this is the one time I was so angry at horror. Like, I didn't know what to do with myself. So I did what any rational fan would do. I dropped Kingdom. That's right. I completely dropped the series, man. I was done with it. I was no longer going to read a series that had just killed off one of the greatest characters of all time. It was too much for me. It was too much for me to handle. And I'm going to tell you what, man. Those five minutes that I dropped Kingdom for were the longest five minutes of my entire life. It's a type of torture that I wouldn't even wish upon my own worst enemy. I mean, come on, you really didn't think I could last without Kingdom for that long, did you? I mean, Kingdom is an addiction, guys, and addictions are hard to quit. It's 10.30 a.m. We don't serve Chicken McNuggets at this time. Yes, you do! No, we don't. Why not? Because we do! You know what? Did you just hiss at me? I'm more than just fucking hiss at you! Alright, so the chapter starts out with Shin and Giyun both staring each other down, having a face-off. Giyun's men are surprised here because they can't believe that Shin was actually able to read Giyun's moves and intercept their surprise attack on Shin's HQ. But Giyun's men aren't the only ones surprised. You could tell by the look in Giyun's eyes that he was not expecting to see Shin here. Why are you here? But this sentiment is shared amongst Shin's men because they can't believe that right now the two bosses are going head to head so quickly. But then you see Giyun eyeing Shin, and he's looking him up and down. And finally, his gaze locks on to Oki's glaive. So as Shin's trying to give his pregame speech about is this Giyun the one who once served under Rin Sojo, he's rudely interrupted by a speed blitz from Giyun. He can't even finish his sentence. And this initial clash had a lot of power behind it. You can see it sending shockwaves throughout the soldiers. And Shin finds himself overwhelmed as he and his horse are sent flying. And this is definitely not a flight that Shin wants to take. When people fly on Air Giyun, it never turns out good. What the fuck? And this really shows that Giyun is the real deal. By the time Shin lands, he's so far away, you can't even see the snake on the top of Giyun's helmet. And not only did he sustain a little bit of damage to his armor, but from that blow, the glaive is still shaking in his hand. And even Shin himself has to acknowledge how powerful Giyun is. He admits the last time he felt a blow this heavy was from Gaimo of the Way Fire Dragons. Giyun's men are in shock because even though Shin got blown back, they can't believe that his glaive is still intact. They wonder what it could possibly be made of to be able to withstand one of Giyun's glaive shattering blows. But Giyun lets them know that that glaive is the glaive of Oki the monstrous bird of Quinn. And Giyun had heard from Roboku that Oki's glaive was amongst the men that they'd be facing, but he wasn't entirely convinced. 
But after a powerful testing blow, this glaive gets the Gion seal of approval, authenticating the fact that this is indeed Oki's glaive. And Shin sarcastically adds, you don't freaking say. But what really surprises Giyun is that he's encountered it so suddenly, but he then thinks that maybe this is a part of his Lord's guidance as well. Because in the past, he not only waged war to shatter that very glaive, but also to take the heads of every single one of the six great generals. This completely blows Shin and his men's minds. They cannot believe what they're hearing. Name something that follows the word pork. You pine. Huh? <laughs> But Giyun says, alas, that would never come to pass. And Shin finds himself stumbling over the words to get an insult in, telling Giyun, no shit, moron. But Giyun, unfazed by this insult, asks the men of Quinn, do you realize that the only reason that you stand before me today is due to a stroke of luck on your part? But man, I have to stop right here because something I wanted to talk about was Giyun's complete lack of acknowledgement of Shin. If you look at the entire conversation that Giyun and Shin just had, there is not a single point that Giyun acknowledges a single word out of Shin's mouth. You could literally take out everything Shin said up until this point and just read Giyun's parts and it would still flow as if Shin said nothing at all. It's almost like Giyun sees him as so inferior that he doesn't even see him as being worth the time of day. But moving on, Shin asks him what does he mean by luck? And he basically goes on to tell him that due to his master being cursed and having a short lifespan, that it pretty much changed the course of history. And that the reality the Quinn currently know would be a far cry from what would have been. He even goes on to state that if his master had stayed healthy, him along with Renpa would have made the Quinn six generals nothing more than food for worms. And then Hyun starts going on and on about the state of Zhao, the state of Quinn, and Sojo's illness. Blah, blah, fucking blah. But Shin's heard enough and he cuts Giyun off saying save the sleep talking nonsense for when you're in bed. Saying that even if Rinsojo didn't die to illness, it wouldn't have mattered because Oki would have killed him anyway. And you can see that for the first time in this chapter, Shin actually has Giyun's attention. And he tells Shin that it's now him who spouts foolishness. But Shin says he's exactly right, it is nonsense. Because everything Giyun's talking about is hypothetical. All of these things that would have so-called happened if Rinsojo were alive don't mean a thing on this battlefield. And he tells Giyun if he wanted to cling to his dead master's shadow, then he would have been better off staying home and wasting away. And after Shin gives Giyun a little taste of his own medicine, you can tell by the faces of Giyun and his men that the flavor is disgusting. But Giyun can't help but to acknowledge some of the truth that he did think that would be his fate. And as he starts to get his men in a position to attack, he tells Shin that the heavens must have had other plans for him. Because due to the fact that they decided to step on his master's prophesied lands, time that was once at a standstill for him has now been set in motion again. And with that, the melee begins. On the other side of the battlefield, we see that the fighting has intensified. Things have actually gotten so messy that Kanto wonders where's Commander Sugen. Possibly because he probably thinks he could get things cleaned up. Then we get a little update on some of the other members of the Haishin unit. And I really thought it was funny in comparison how Garo was pumped coming from the Dukio camp and that Naki and his men were jokingly wishing that they hadn't transferred over to the Haishin unit because this isn't the type of battle that they're used to. And then finally we see En just trying to hold things together, telling his men to stand strong and do not falter. But amidst all the commotion on the battlefield, Kyokai is still able to sense that off in the distance Shin is also engaged in a battle that will test his limits. And this was actually a pretty cool thing to see because the last thing Shin told Kyokai is that he'd be right behind her. So for her to notice that Shin actually went to another location on the battlefield just shows how strong their connection is. Back over at Shin, we see that him and Kiyun are exchanging blows, but it appears that Shin is the one who's actually taking damage. And his men really can't believe that he's on the back foot even though he has Oki's glaive. But Shin says it's more because he has Oki's glaive. Because not only is Giyun fast, but since he hasn't mastered it yet, he's not able to use it as perfectly as he'd like to. And on that note, Shin takes a brutal slash to the front of his armor, which causes his men to scream out in concern. And with Shin slumped down on his horse, things are not looking good. And after this initial bout, Giyun almost seems somewhat disappointed, saying, you dare to mock my master with those skills, Shin of the Hajshin unit? Which is already a crushing blow to Shin. But he even takes it a step further saying that he can almost hear the cries of sorrow coming from Oki's glaive. Saying that that glaive he carries is a jewel amongst weapons and it harbors many things. 
but that Shin is nothing more than a mistake, and that he was just a fortunate citizen of Quinn blessed with luck, whose life just happened to coincide with Oki's death, and that all he needed to do was just lay out his hands and Oki's glaive would fall right into it. Basically telling Shin that all he is is a man whose only trait of note is the sheer amount of good fortune that has come his way. And with that, we see Shin reliving one of the most iconic moments in all of Kingdom, as Oki not only passes the glaive on to Shin, but also smiles as if to say, I'm counting on you Shin, I'm putting everything in your hands. And reliving Oki's final moments has revived Shin's fighting spirit. As Gyu Un's words play back through his head, he swings Oki's glaive with such force that it catches Gyu Un completely off guard. And he says, don't talk as if you know anything. And that was the chapter in a nutshell, guys. And even though Kingdom was on break last week, guys, it came back delivering yet another excellent chapter. And after reading it, I know Gyu Un is not long for this world. And I still think this fight's gonna last more than one day, but after seeing all this trash stuff from Gyu Un, I'm really not too sure anymore. It looks like he's enraged Shin to the point that he may be in a little bit of trouble. But we'll have to wait and see because this fight seems to have taken things to a whole nother level. Where both of these guys are pupils to masters who are already dead, and both seem to have had a strong bond with their masters. To the point where it almost feels like it's not just Shin vs Gyu Un, but also Oki versus Rin Sojo. And the victor of this battle will show which master left the heavier weight on his student's shoulders. Because just like when Oki and Hoken were fighting, even though Hoken had Oki beat from an ability standpoint, he was still unable to defeat him because Oki's strength came from the burden of all the people who had died before him and whose will that he had to carry on, which is the weight that rests on every general's shoulders. And we'll just have to see if the weight that Shin has on his shoulders is enough to get him past Gyun. Another thing I thought that was pretty cool in this chapter was all the details that Gyun knew about Shin inheriting Oki's glaive. The way he was talking, it was almost like he was there himself, which just lets you know how much detail Roboku actually gave to Gyun about the situation. And this actually gives us a little bit of detail about how deep Roboku's intel was during those times. Because when you look back, Roboku does mention during the banquet at Kanyo that his informants did let him know Shin had inherited Oki's glaive. But to have it down to this level of detail shows you that his spies were definitely within that last inner circle and pretty much had front row seats to get those type of details. Another little thing that caught my attention was where is Sugen at? Because if you notice, Kanto actually asked where did the infantry commander go? Now this could mean nothing at all where he's just saying where did he go because the situation is a mess right now or this could possibly be hinting that Sugen's up to something. I could be wrong but I have a feeling that maybe him and a few of the other veterans may have went to help reinforce Shin. And I could be reading a little too deep into that but I did think it was worth mentioning. Especially since they really didn't show a lot of the other uh, units. But anyway guys, that about does it for this week's video. Let me know what you guys thought about the chapter in the comments section below. Please leave a like if you guys enjoyed the video and feel free to share, comment, and subscribe. Peace out.